Hey, James Merrick. Hey, nigger. James Merrick. I want your autograph, nigger. James Merrick. People ask me, who is James Meredith? I tell them to make sure they really want to know. You must have your thinking cap on to scratch the surface of understanding who he really is. Don't try to box him into a movement. He never did fit confined. James is brilliant, yet approachable. Is learned, yet thrives to know more. He is a shrewd strategist who manipulated the U.S. government to partner in the largest single coup against the stronghold of white supremacy. I believe James's fearlessness is due to his unwavering faith, his confidence in knowing that he is divinely protected. Mississippi and the federal government against each other. End result. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going up there without the federal government supporting him. Mm -hmm. And figure out enough killed. evidence. No, 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 no. That was the whole I thing. had to trick them to nobody. You ever heard of John Kennedy yes. and Bobby Kennedy? Mm -hmm. Nobody was more shocked <laughs> than Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy. When they had to bring all them troops down to Mississippi. They had to bring all them troops down there. <laughs> they didn't know. <laughs> I mean, you talking about leading them down in a trap. <laughs> I trapped the federal government far worse than Mississippi. And when they realized what had happened, <laughs> it was too late. <laughs> <laughs> Too late to turn around. They had to go forward. <laughs> and a lot of things happened in that. A lot of things. Lot James of had to tell him he wasn't going unless they supported him. Mm -hmm. And then they got him down there and they had black troops coming out of Vietnam that was leading the army. And they would take them black troops and set them on the side picking up garbage instead of them letting them do their job. And the army couldn't do his job. James wrote I called them Kennedys and told them if they didn't put them back in the line doing their job, he was going to quit. Guess what? Yeah. They started doing what they were supposed to do. That's right. Having them do what they were supposed to do. That's right. And gave them the guns back. And gave them guns loaded. Mm. Uh, against Mississippi white folks. Oxford, Mississippi, Sunday, September 30th, 1962. The court had decided. The time had come. President John Kennedy told Governor Ross Barnett, who had earlier blocked James Meredith's entrance, that Meredith must now be enrolled at the University of Mississippi. I've taken an oath to buy the laws of this state and our state constitution. The constitution of the United States. And <laughs> generally, how can I violate my oath of office? How can I do that and live with the people of Mississippi? You know, they're expecting me to keep my word. That's what I'm up against, and I uh, don't oh, why, why the court wouldn't understand that. Governor, this is the president speaking. 
Yes, sir. Uh, now, it's, uh, I know that you're feeling about uh, the uh, law of Mississippi and the fact that uh, you don't want to carry out that court order. What we really want to have from you, though, is some understanding about whether the state police will maintain law and order. We understand your feeling about the court order and your yes. disagreement with it. But what we're concerned about is uh, how much violence is going to be and what kind of uh, action we'll have to take to prevent it. And I'd like to get assurances from you about that the state police down there will take positive action to maintain law and order. Then well, we'll, we'll know what we have to do. Take, they'll take positive action, Mr. President, to maintain law and order as best we can. Anticipating fierce defiance by the people there, the President sent several hundred federal marshals to Oxford, and the Justice Department orchestrated Meredith's secret entrance onto campus. But even as President Kennedy broadcast an appeal for calm, insurrection against the federal government had begun. We couldn't consider moving Meredith if, you, if we haven't been able to restore order outside. That's the problem, Governor. Well, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. President. Yeah. I'll go up there myself. Well, now, how long will it take you to get there? And I'll get uh, a microphone and tell them that uh, you have agreed to, to, to be removed. No, no, now, wait a minute. How long is, wait a minute, Governor. Now, how long is it going to take you to get up there? About an hour. Now, I tell you what, if you want to go up there, you, then you call me from up there, and then we'll decide what we're going to do before you make any speeches about it. Well, all right. There's well, no sense I in mean, there. Whatever you, if you don't. See, we don't. We got an hour to go, and that's not. Uh, we may not have an hour, but it won't uh, take you an hour to get up there. President, please, why don't you uh, teach you give an order to try to remove me? How can I remove him, Governor? When there's a, a riot in the street, and he may step out of that building, and something happen to him. I can't remove him under those conditions. You can, uh, let's get uh, order up there, then we can do something about that. Surround it with plenty of officials. Well, we've got to get somebody up there now to get order and stop the firing and the shooting. Then we, you and I will talk on the phone about Meredith. Marshals were losing their fight to secure the campus. It left Kennedy with no choice. He sent in the military. But by the time they arrived, two people were dead. An Oxford resident and a French journalist. And dozens of marshals were injured. By early morning, the military had restored order, occupying Ole Miss and the town of Oxford. In the aftermath of car fires, tear gas, fumes, and rioters arrested, Meredith was escorted to the registrar's private office, where the enrollment of the university's first black student was completed. James H. Meredith is formally enrolled at the University of Mississippi, ending one chapter in the federal government's efforts to desegregate the university. The town of Oxford is an armed camp, following riots that accompany the registration of the first Negro in the university's 118-year history. Much of this film record was destroyed when our cameraman, Gordon Yoder, was attacked, but he did salvage pictures of Governor Ross Barnett at the scene. The governor fought the court order long and bitterly before modifying his stand saying Mississippi was overpowered by the federal government. President Kennedy appealed to the students and to the people of the state to comply peacefully with the law and bring the crisis to an end. Even as he talked, riots were breaking out in Oxford. If this country should ever reach the point where any man or group of men, by force or threat of force, could long deny the commands of our court and our Constitution, then no law would stand free from doubt. No judge would be sure of his writ, and no citizen would be safe from his neighbors. Nearly 6,000 troops patrol Oxford to maintain order, and arrests mount to more than 200 as smaller disturbances erupt the next day. Former Major General Edwin Walker, who came here from his home in Texas, is put under arrest and held in high bail on charges of inciting insurrection. He was flown to a federal prison hospital as relative calm settled on the town in the greatest crisis the South has faced since the Civil War. America had a segregated society. Mississippi was the epitome of that segregation. And the segregation was to sustain white supremacy by forcing blacks in every way 
to not enjoy the rights and privileges of citizenship in the United States of America. So when this movement uh, becomes bigger, were you afraid or of this violence that wake up all of a sudden? Now what people have to understand, particularly in France and Germany, I had already won my war before I ever stepped on the campus of Old Myth. My goal when I attacked Mississippi was to force the federal government into a position where they had to use the military might of the United States to support my rights as a citizen. Did you see here? This was Camp Meredith. That's just a small segment. The only time in history you ever had a camp of soldiers against Mississippi American citizens. And see you here when you come back in your family. That's my mother here. I don't know who this lady is, but I mean, uh, that's my mother. And my mother and my father were the principal engineers of what I did. My mother started when I was seven years old preparing me for my role. those older students that was there when James was here and I, you get where you can spot them because they're standing up over there and they kind of in turmoil should I speak to them should I not speak to them mm -hmm. they got to get it off their chest That's and right. sooner or later they always walk up to James and they always go something like this and they'll say James I'm ashamed to say this and some of them will say I lived right down the hall from you at Vassar Hall I'm ashamed to say this I would have never shaken your hand back then I would have never spoken to you and then they'll stick their hand out and they say, mm -hmm. but I just want you to know it's an honor to shake your hand. Right. It happens every time I work. And more powerfully, he extends mm -hmm. his hand. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. And exactly. you needed to hear that, and they needed to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> yeah, and we appreciate that for sure. That's the heroic part. You know, now, since I want nobody else say nothing, I'll say this <laughs> about the Kennedys. <laughs> okay. I knew you were there. I was always sure, and I'm more sure now, that just about every major decision made regarding the black-white thing during the 60s, during the Kennedy administration, was made by the granddaddy of these two. That's right. Mm -hmm. And no question in my mind that in terms of me and encouraging me, their granddaddy, not only the only person high up <laughs> that I ever talked to in the Kennedy and the other government, but uh, he invited me to his house uh, in New York when he was senator. 
And uh, <laughs> treat me like I thought I should have been treated. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it wouldn't be important now, but it was extremely important then. And one week after I applied for Ole Miss and was trying to keep myself from getting lynched, <laughs> and that's what it was about, because old Mississippi was known for eliminating anybody who threatened the status quo. Uh, I wrote the Kennedy administration. And John Kennedy died in 1963. And they built him a library in uh, Boston. And at the entrance to that library, a copy of that letter that I wrote. Wow. You understand that? And when your granddaddy died, they put a, his desk in the rotunda of the Justice Department. That same letter was in the upper left-hand corner, and the last time I was there, it was still there. And I told him, <laughs> plain and simple, my biggest concern <laughs> was staying alive <laughs> until the decision was made. <laughs> The famous picture of James walking out the door over here. Mm -hmm. If you look at that picture, James is the coolest head and the calmest person in the whole picture. Mm -hmm. He even has a swagger in his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've asked James, we've talked about it many times, I said, what were you thinking about? You're the calmest guy there. You see hatred in all these people's faces. He's got the, the president's man, Mr. McShane, and the and deputy attorney general door, Bobby Kennedy's man on each side of him, and all these U.S. Marshals, 400 U.S. Marshals standing around, what were you thinking? <laughs> and he said, when I walked out the front door, I couldn't help thinking about my old Air Force commander, because I had told him back in the early 50s when he asked me what my goals were, and he's from Mississippi, I said, I want to be the first Negro to go to the University of Mississippi on Miss, and he said, I think that's a good cause but you need to be prepared to die because you could easily get killed. And he said, I wasn't thinking about getting killed because I didn't think, God, didn't think God was going to let me get killed. He didn't, <laughs> and thank God. <laughs> and, uh, but um, he said, I just couldn't help thinking finally about that because he actually had encouraged me. He thought it was a good thing to do. And he said, and then the next thing, he said, you're right, I saw all that hatred in a lot of those people's eyes, but I tried to block it out because I... And, and that hoped that one day maybe they would understand why I was doing this and maybe I would even become their friend. Mm -hmm. Well, that happens over and over mm -hmm. in the Grove now when he yes. walks across mm -hmm. the right. Grove. And, uh, and he mm -hmm. said, uh, and I intentionally did my best to look calm. I read about what the Pope going back through the gates of Rome. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. I didn't want people to think that history would record that I looked fearful or was uncertain about what I was doing. And then the last thing, he said, you know, I noticed that the president's men and attorney general's men wore coats and ties, but I didn't own a coat and tie. <laughs> and But my big brother Arthur did. Little brother. Little brother Arthur <laughs> did, who's taller, <laughs> who's taller than he is. And he said, so in that picture, when he's standing there about to walk across the street and you got the National Press Corps right there, he was telling me what he was thinking. He said, I was thinking... I sure do hope they shoot me from waist up because my <laughs> pants are three inches too long. I showed him the picture. Wow. Ed Meek, I told, Ed, I told Meek when he did that book riding on all those pictures, I said, do you realize what you've done? You have pictures of James Merrick with his pants too long. <laughs> <laughs> They're about five inches too long. <laughs> oh, but, uh, oh, this behind the scenes great. stuff you never know. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. That's, that's really well, I... I um, I mean, I think I, I should. I just want to say that I'm so like honored to be here, and I just want to thank you know, all of you guys like so much because we, Kick and I, grew up, you know, not only like reading about you in history classes and and like learning about you in the civil rights movement and what like an important role you played, but also like from my dad who just absolutely like reveres you and. Uh, just hearing stories about, uh, you know, like what an important role you played and how much respect, like my grandpa and you know, my great uncle had for you, from him, like directly. It's just like it's um, 
it's absolutely like incredible for us to like be here in person now. Um, but he said to us yesterday um, something that I, I thought was really interesting, which is he said that this was really like the last battle of the uh, civil rights movement. And it's pretty amazing for me to then, you know, look through those, those photos with Hiram and see that it's just you, you know, and you, you've got 30,000, you know, National Guards like backing you up, but it's just you who decided to go on that, uh, who decided to admit yourself here and, and to fight that battle, you know, alone. And it takes like a tremendous amount of bravery, uh, you know, and, and uh, fortitude to, to be able to do that and say that I'm going to, you know, wage that battle alone. And so I just, yeah, I mean, I just, we have so much respect for you and we're so, so. And Thank you. Yeah, to be actually here with you is sort of this amazing experience. I never thought I'd be so lucky. And I just want to thank you for what you've done in your life. And also on behalf of my entire family, because they've been giving us a lot of phone calls. It's a lot of messages coming your way. <laughs> and they're all of love and gratitude and inspiration. So um, anyway, it's been an honor to shake your hand. Yeah. Thank you. That's what God told me to say, just said thank you. <laughs> Yeah. never do nothing to him, though, did he? I mean, jail. he didn't stay in jail. Anything. For 18 months. Okay. Well, that's better than most of them. He was the first in the history of Mississippi to go to jail for shooting a black. Mm. A lot of it did make our television and our newspaper because they would always refer to him as a graduate of Gibbs High School. Mm. And that's, <laughs> that's how that information... Uh, got down there. On June 5th, 1966, James Meredith started on his 220-mile march against fear from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. His goal? To encourage blacks to register and vote. His message was fairly simple. Any person should be able to walk any road without fear of being harmed by white supremacists. The blacks were notoriously intimidated and threatened when it came to exercising their right to vote. There was a sultry Sunday morning when Meredith started out on the second day with a Bible in his hand. Another man, Aubrey James Norville, an unemployed hardware store worker from Memphis, was also making his way down that same rural road, Highway 51. He carried a shotgun and sat hidden in tall brush, waiting for the chance to pull the trigger. When Meredith was nearing Hernando, Mississippi, Norville's intent became clear. In a grasp, resolved voice, he shouted, James Meredith, I just want James Meredith. Norville leveled his stare, steadied his hand, and fired. The three shotgun blasts hit Meredith in his back, legs, and head. He lay on the ground, bleeding, until help arrived. A hearse from a nearby funeral home rushed Meredith to a Memphis hospital. With that, Norval became the first white man to be arrested for shooting a black in Mississippi. As Meredith recuperated in the hospital, Word of the assassination attempt flew around the country with lightning speed. Several black leaders hurried to Mississippi with intent to complete Meredith's march against fear. Reverend King, Stokely Carmichael, Floyd McKissick, and Roy Wilkins from the NAACP, CORE, SCLC, and SNCC put aside their diverse and opposing philosophies on the civil rights movement to join Meredith's mission. As those leaders walked through Mississippi, 
Multitudes of people joined them throughout small rural towns, many of them registering to vote for the first time. When they reached Jackson, Meredith, having been released from the hospital, joined the more than 10,000 marchers. It was another chapter in Mississippi's history and in America's new reality. The South was slowly grinding ahead. This place should be overflowing with children. And I'm going to tell you why it ain't. Because everything she said was about what white folk did and what white folk ought to do and what white folk didn't do. The future of the black race, the future of Mississippi, the future of the world depends upon what we do now. And it ain't just this church. I went to 56 black churches in a row. And they were all doing the same thing. Yeah. Establishing a class thing. Yeah. And everybody who need to be in this church according to the God, the Bible I've been reading, yeah. would be unwelcome here. Yeah. Because you wouldn't want to grab and hug and kiss them. <laughs> And that's the whole, that, those are most of all the people Jesus Christ ever talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Were the people you didn't want to yeah. be around. Yeah. Those are the people that you owe this training to. Yeah. This opportunity to learn. Don't unite us, make us one. We speak in anger against our fellow man Has torn apart the fabric of our land See, hatred is a poison that spreads through you and me But forgiveness brings the freedom that we need, yeah so I raise my hand to take a stand. Lord, unite our hearts. Give a brand new start. Make, Make us, us one, one, Lord. Make us one, by Lord. By your spirit. By your spirit. Make us one united people. Oh. Burned by your blood. Make us one, please make a miracle one. Lord, unite us. Oh, I want to sing it one more time. Lord, unite us, man. 